Hi, my name is Gina Brewer, and um, I'm Vice President of Marin Women's Political Action Committee and also Endorsement Chair. I am, aren't I? <laughs> yes, no? Um, so thank you all for coming. And this um, event is being videotaped for our website, which is mwpac.org. And uh, this way, over the course of time, we're, we're building up a library of hopefully useful information so that you can check back later if you need some further guidance. Um, MWPAC used to be the uh, part of the National Women's Political Caucus, Marin Chapter. We quit that last year because they put in writing that you could no longer recommend men. And we've always included men in our process. We endorse women and we recommend men. It's a semantics thing, but uh, that's the way we do it. Women also get money when they're endorsed. Uh, men don't. The idea being that for so long there was the good old boys network, so we're trying to establish a good old girls network. And our ultimate goal is 50-50. So we'd like 50% of the elected offices to be held by women. But there are so many enlightened men in Marin that we could not possibly eliminate um, having men in our process. So uh, what we look for, um, we send out a questionnaire to candidates in selected races. We obviously can't do everything. Uh, we have an uh, endorsement night this year. It's on September 12th at uh, the San Rafael City Council Chambers at 7 p.m. So we have sent out questionnaires in selected races, and um, we look for um, people to uh, answer the questions so that we know that they basically value uh, our bottom line issues, and which are spelled out very clearly, and it's pretty obvious when you see the questionnaire. Uh, also, we want to make sure that it is that people are running valid campaigns, that they have campaign managers, and that they have an adequate budget. Um, so not everyone agrees with our values, so some people choose not to participate, which is fine. Um, but of those that do, we seem to have a pretty good percentage of people who do seek our endorsement and do come to our endorsement meetings. Um, we invite the ones that uh, do uh, meet our criteria. And uh, at our meetings, um, we ask the candidates to make a brief opening statement. And then we ask questions of the candidates. We ask the same question to each candidate. Uh, and the questions come from the endorsement committee and from the audience. So depending on our time, uh, we can ask three questions, five questions, depending on um, how much time we have and also how hot the race is. Obviously, some races, there's a lot of controversy, which we like. Um, then the members vote. We ask everyone else to leave but the members, and they vote on endorsements. A candidate has to get 51% of the members' votes. Um, and then we, um, as I say, we decide on the amount of money to give our candidates that we endorse. Then we send out a, a press release and also we'll be posting our endorsements on our website, so which is again mwpac.org. So it's a pretty straightforward process and um, we've been doing it for many years and uh, as I say, now we're a new organization our birthday was a year ago, May, uh, but we're pretty much following the same standards that we have uh, honed over the years. Uh, and like I said, the main, the main thing that made us strike out on our own was because we did want to include men in the process. But our mission is to get a lot of good women elected to office, and we also help by offering our services, mentoring, um, uh, 
walking, you know, the precincts, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of experienced people who are members who have run for races, who have been successful in races. So we have a lot of resources to give candidates. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Maldonado. I'm executive director of the North Bay Labor Council, which is part of the AFL-CIO. How many folks here are familiar with labor unions, have been in the labor union, or the parents will? Okay, good. Um, that's good to know. So I, I want to kind of dispense with the, uh, you know, the talking and let people ask some questions. Um, most endorsement, or a lot of endorsements, um, in labor especially, are very similar to what you just heard described. Um, and for me, if I were here, if I was you guys, I would have run out of this room screaming for <laughs> because I got into politics. The thing I like about politics is the issues. I'm a political person. I see things through a political lens. And the reason I got into the labor movement is because um, as a kid, you know, my, my father came here from Mexico. He was uh, undocumented. He was deported many, many times. Uh, he came here picking cotton, picking strawberries in Watsonville, um, picking mushrooms in, in Davenport. And um, when he met my mother, and they got married, my mother's from here, um, and then my grandpa helped him get his citizenship, he, he got a union card. He went from being a, you know, a farm worker to being a busboy and a waiter, and then a laborer. My grandpa got him in the laborer's union, then he became a teamster. And when my dad became a teamster, um, I remember I was eight, my brother was nine, and we got health care for the first time. We went to Kaiser, and we had uh, checkups. We had dental. We, our whole life changed. We went from, basically my father had a third grade education in Mexico, and we were able to buy a house on his and my mother's salary, she's a school teacher, a kindergarten teacher, and my brother and I both went to college, I went to law school. I saw the transformation into the middle class in my family, and I want that for other people. That's what brings me to politics. And that's what brings me into the labor movement, that's why I love the labor movement, because I want everybody to have that. I think it's. It's so sad now, the way the inequality in our country, the huge, massive uh, maldistribution of wealth, all of those issues. So if you're a candidate and you come to me and you talk about caring about working people, caring about families, what your life was like if you were in a union, I don't care what you're wearing, because I'm going to vote for you. <laughs> I was acutely aware, I was telling Steve, that I wasn't wearing a bra when all this talk <laughs> started going about, uh, about what people were wearing. Um, and that's a policy decision I made, because when, the, um, when it goes over a certain degree of height, it's just in summer, you know, if it's, if it's over 85, it's just forget it. No pantyhose, no bra. Sorry. That's my policy. Um, TMI. <laughs> but I think that what I've seen or what I hear people talking about when they get into politics is way too much of the substance, the presentation and not, a, not the substance. And I will tell you this, yes, a lot of what people say is true. It, you do get judged, especially if you're a woman, you get really judged. But you should make up your, I mean, you're gonna get judged anyways. People are gonna call you a bitch. They're gonna say you slept with people. I mean, even if you didn't sleep with people, which is a drag, because then you don't even get, you know. I mean, yes. You know, what's the use of being good, right? But um, they will say you're a bitch. They will say um, you were too, show too much cleavage. They will say you are showing too much leg. They're saying you're mutton dressed as lamb. I mean, right? They're going to say all this. But you have to get past that. You have to be so grounded in who you are and what you care about, and you communicate that to the voters, and they will vote for you. Um, I, I want to talk about labor, and I know a lot of people have misconceptions about this. I, I really want to talk about one candidate in particular, because she did break a lot of rules. Shirley Zane, who we supported for supervisor in, um, and actually I should pass some of these out to folks. These are, these are all labor, these are our materials. When labor endorses you, if you're in a priority race and you are a staunch and stalwart, not just a good vote, not just sympathetic, but a fighter and a warrior for working people, we will walk for you, we will call for you, we will raise money for you. In these races, you can hand that off. In these races, we spent over $600,000 for getting folks elected for Board of Supervisors because those, our workers are affected by those decisions. Local races are where the rubber meets the road for working people and we want to play, we want to have a say. What you have to be willing, and they de definitely came after Shirley, called her a tool of the unions, and you know, the press Democrat called, told us we were buying the bargaining. You know, unions, we get a lot of flack. So if you don't have the guts to stand up for working people, we're not gonna support you, because we expect more than just a vote, we expect you to be a leader, we expect you to believe in this. The best way to find out and educate yourself, and, and we're happy to help you, 
Um, but the best way is to go to the AFL-CIO website, look at the issues, especially around construction. Go to the Building Trades and Construction website. Look at the issues about prevailing wage. Those are questions that are going to be asked. Questions about public education, pensions, all of that stuff. Um, and, and we will help you. And there are certainly examples where we don't always agree. For example, the Roner Park Casino. This is a huge union project. It's built union. It's got a card check all the way through. And um, if, as you can imagine, it's not the most popular thing in Roner Park right now um, for a variety of reasons. Although, personally, I think it classes the join up, if you ask me. I don't know how many of you guys have been to Roner Park. But. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at people who will welcome a Hooters and a, you know, Walmart, and I was like, oh, no, we don't want casinos. Um, but the fact that it was being built union, the fact that it was done developmentally the way that it should have been, this is what we should require of every developer in terms of good jobs and you know, good benefits to the workers. Shirley had a history of working um, at a senior center, and she didn't believe in gambling. Even though I explained to her that basically gambling is the same thing for white people in the stock market, that's gambling. But for the rest of us, hey, you know, it's gambling if you're in the casino. But she didn't care. She was like principally opposed to it. This is a huge issue for us. So what we were able to agree upon was when she spoke about the issue, obviously she wants to stay true to her principles. And she'd say, I don't believe in gambling. I think it's bad, especially for seniors. They can, you know, addiction. But she did say, in fairness to the tribe, they have put together the best kind of a development project. One that brings something to the city, one that treats workers fairly. I think all development projects should be like this, should be used like this. We should ask this from Walmart, we should ask this from Home Depot. So she was able to support labor on an issue where we she actually we had a, a disagreement, but we could still, in principle, agree on certain things. So people don't have to feel like they support every labor cause. Believe me, in labor, we all don't even agree. But when we do know that you're committed to helping uh, working families, we will move heaven and earth. We cannot always outspend the Chamber of Commerce and some of those folks at North Coast Builders Exchange. The Builders Exchange is generally the SCAB contractors, and if anyone, I mean for us and for the building trades here, that's kiss of death on any, um, I mean we generally don't support people with that because we have, but it's just that those folks are very anti-union. They spend their time trying to get rid of unions. It's just not something we're going to be able to, to support. So um, you can call us if you're a candidate. We will help you. We will do whatever we can. And we have a, um, I would say we have from 300 to 600 volunteers phoning. We will phone through. And not only phone, we will send our own, if you're a priority race, we'll send two or three pieces of mail. You'll get out in, uh, we'll do a, um, this is our sheet that goes to every union member in the county. This, uh, this, this slate card, okay? We send one of these, and then the State Federation of Labor includes our um, endorsements in another one that goes to every union member. And in Sonoma, I don't know the number, I should know the numbers here, Marina, it's, it's pretty large, but in Sonoma, for example, in Shirley Zane's um, district, the third district, we had over 6,000 union members. We phoned them, walked them, talked to them at least once and, and sometimes twice. So it can make the difference in your race if, if, you know, if, you, if, you, if, if you become a targeted race for us. But even if you're not, we do races like the Novato Sanitary District because we're talking about outsourcing workers there. We'll, you know, and we want to see people grow, especially labor people. If you've been a teacher or if you've been um, you know, an electrician and you want to get into politics, we're there to help you. We want to get you going. But we do, you know, we do want you to have a, a viable campaign and we'll help you with that as well. And one last thing, I mean, a little um, dig to all the campaign people, because I do, I, I agree with them, but sometimes they're not always right, and you should have a strong, you know, listen to your, your campaign manager, but you can argue with them, too. You don't always have to do everything their way, okay? Because they don't know everything, and half the time, the polling, they'll tell you, um, election, they, they, it, it's not math, okay? It's not like you do this, and then you do this, and then you win. It's more like theater. You can have a great play, but if the audience isn't buying it for whatever reason, it doesn't happen. So it's a very interactive thing. And plays are different, different days. So don't think of it as math, think of it as theater, but more substance. And that's it. Thank you. So um, my name is Erica Erickson, and I'm with Grassroots Leadership Network in Marin County. We are 15 year old um, 
nonprofit organization created to strengthen the voice of underrepresented community members in Marin, especially low income uh, families and people of color. So primarily we work with the Canal neighborhood, Marin City, and some parts of Novato. We basically work with very similar values of the uh, Labor Council, and we are all pro working family and social equity, and the advancement of social equity and justice. So when we were created, we basically strengthened the capacity of community leaders to manage and to create and manage grassroots projects. So Canal Welcome Center, for example, was one of our projects that we facilitated creation and um, Marine City Fatherhood Program that doesn't is not active anymore, but was um, kind of incubated by us and many others. So we have been building relationships in a strong network with community leaders in this um, neighborhood. And nowadays, we have different coalitions, including the Marine City Martin Luther King Coalition that's based in Marine City, so it's a place-based coalition. Also, we have um, issue-based, issue-focused coalitions like the Transportation Equity Alliance of Marin, the Public Transportation Equity here in Marin County in the region. We also have trainings like the Equal Voice Leadership Academy to really build the capacity of leaders of you know, profit organizations to really um, strengthen the advocacy capacity of the organization they are part of, being as a volunteer or a staff member, so it promotes voter registration and education in this um, in the communities through their organization, through their clients or members and staff and constituency. So lately, we have because of uh, many of you probably heard about the analysis of impediments for fair housing in Marin, uh, where Marin County got national attention for being one of the widest counties in the Bay Area and the United States. We uh, have been facilitating. Uh, group that is uh, comprised of many leaders from the communities of color and low income communities, and they now have a name, we have a name, that's the Action Coalition for Equity, and we are creating a political action committee. What will be, we just got a 501c4 at this first year, in the first year we are going to uh, endorse few candidates for a specific race we are targeting, um, but we hope to get stronger and to promote and advance equity in the county, not only regarding housing, but many other area of issues that impact working families, people of color and low-income families. So um, I want to thank all the candidates for stepping up, and if you would like to get more educated about the issues that we care about, that we talk about, I have uh, copies of our political action uh, agenda, policy action agenda that was created in 2008 during the presidential election um, with the participation of more than 600 um, local working families and that covers issues like housing, healthcare, economic development, etc. And uh, I really, if you would like more information about the political action committee, I also can give you, I brought some copies about that. And I would like to ask, like, uh, I have a, um, someone somewhere said, or some, um, in one time said that, um, a quote that I really care about, like, really speak to what uh, I believe in is, like, when you as a candidate, you're going to probably be uh, uh, elected official, many of you. So when you are facing a decision and uh, think about the poorest, and most uh, underrepresented and vulnerable person that you ever met, and make the decision that most benefits that person. And so I think that that's what we stand for. Um, social equity is about that. So your role, your responsibility to promote um, equality of opportunities is bigger than ever. Uh, and so I hope that you embrace that with a lot of responsibility and we will support you if you for that if you are for that. So thanks for the opportunity and I hope to work with you pretty soon. Thank you. Any questions? Joan. Joan. Oh, there was, oh, there was a question. 
because quickly ask Lisa and Erica which races you are targeting. Well, uh, we I'm part of a, a committee, so we have been talking about Sarah Powell, um, the mayor uh, position, and city council, but we haven't decided all of them yet, so I cannot speak to that. Um, ours is similar. We generally go by the affected locals, and I think um, San Rafael City Council, um, Board of Soups, um, those tend to be. Uh, um, we might go to some city councils, the smaller cities, wherever there are um, workers. Um, but certainly, right now, the largest amount of workers are the home health care workers, county government workers, um, and electricians. Those are some of the largest groups we have, so wherever those are. But you can always. <coughs> You know, call us and ask us. We are doing a Candidates 101 um, that is going to be on September 26th. So just contact me. I'll, I'll put my number out there for folks and uh, leave my card with folks. So if you're interested, you can, you can let me know. Yes. Uh, we were talking today about minimum wage, <coughs> a fellow worker and I, and we thought that it was inequitable that the minimum wage is $8 per hour. And we think that's non living wage. And so my automatic response was, to $16 an hour. That should be the minimum wage. And then another thing that I'm personally very interested in, I think it's most very appropriate to what you're talking about, is ABAG requires all the jurisdictions in Marin to provide housing units, dwelling units. And not one single jurisdiction has been able to meet the target. And it's not that difficult to do if you make the second units and there's ways to do it. So I, I and there's different alternative programs that no one seems to be doing that could be done. And so I feel, so for instance, Fairfax is supposed to provide one a month for five years. One new dwelling unit per month for five years. And it took them two years to decide about one house. <laughs> well, I mean, I just want to speak to one thing, which is that a lot of the information you get is, is class-based or, I mean, all of it, right? What, what some people consider tasteful, other people will find boring. So it does a lot of what you're, who you're speaking to and the issues you choose to speak on are going to change with the people that you're speaking to. So I mean, I, I, and, and this keep the same thing in mind whenever people talk about conflict. I know people want to avoid conflict and certainly with the issue of target and um, I, I was thinking of your question because in labor we would never give you a pass on that target and the minute you said I don't know. We'd be like, mm, you know, <laughs> um, it would be okay for you to say. And to answer that question by saying, I have concerns about those low wage jobs. How will those people be able to live in our city if they're only making, you know, how, you can talk about the concerns and then also say, but I also know that a lot of people like to shop there. I mean, there's a way to answer the question that speaks to the principles, your principles and our principles and where they meet um, without cutting anybody out. But I personally, and I think a lot of people in general, voters, would rather disagree with someone who's being honest and genuine, then hear, or I don't know if we're televised, bull from somebody who is, they think is trying to give them the right answer, really. And they sense that. People have, voters especially, have incredible bull detectors, and they don't like, they know when somebody's lying to them, and they, when somebody wants their vote. I'd rather have somebody say their principles respectfully, but say, well, I disagree with you, you know? And then, you, you know, you'll, you might still get their vote, because they think that you're honest. And you are being honest and genuine. 